I first came across an image like this about the four fundamental subspaces toward the end of my first linear algebra class. I had no idea what was going on. Range of A, null space of A, those I understood. But where did the transpose come in? Why does turning the columns of a matrix into rows mean anything geometrically? I hope that this explanation will provide an intuition as to what is actually going on in this diagram, how the four fundamental spaces work, and where on earth that transpose comes from. We will start by talking about the four fundamental subspaces. What are their components? What do they mean for linear transformations? We will use an example linear map and the notion of its pseudo-inverse to describe each of the four spaces. Then we'll connect the pseudo-inverse with the transpose using the concept of the singular value decomposition, a way of breaking down a linear transformation into three distinct units. Before we start, if you're kind of fuzzy on the concepts of matrices as linear maps, or what the range or null space of a matrix looks like geometrically, I would definitely recommend you check out 3Blue1Brown's linear algebra videos. They give amazing intuitions into how to visualize these concepts, and I'll be relying heavily on those intuitions in this explanation. All right, so let's dive in. In the abstract, the four fundamental subspaces are a way to divide up the input and output space of a linear transformation. There are the parts that are transformed, the ranges in red, and the parts that are thrown away, either squished to zero in the null space, or are orthogonal to what can be output, the null space of the transpose. To make things more concrete, we're going to consider a linear transformation, A, that acts as a map between R2 and R3. Because it's a mapping between two and three dimensions, it can be represented as a 3 by 2 matrix, like this. Let's further say that the columns of this matrix are linearly dependent, so that the range of A, or the column space of the matrix, is a line in R3. For review, the range, or column space, of A is the set of all vectors that A maps to in the output space. So you take any vector in R2, apply A to it, which involves taking a linear combination of the columns of the matrix representing A, and you get a vector whose tip is on this line. Let's also say that the null space of A is a line, here represented by this blue line in R2. Again, for review, the null space, or the kernel of A, is the set of all vectors in the input space that A maps to zero in the output space. If either of these concepts of null space or range are unfamiliar, I would highly suggest looking at 3Blue1Brown's linear algebra series. He goes into a lot more detail. Okay, so we already have characterized two of the subspaces, but these are the ones we're familiar with. To get the other two subspaces, let's take a closer look at what happens when A is applied. Because we know that the null space will end up at zero, applying A will squish R2 like this. So all the vectors in R2 will end up on this red line. This line is orthogonal to the null space of A. The line will then be thrown into R3, and it will end up as the range of A. Now, this line in R2 happens to be the range of A transpose, but that isn't clear from anything we've seen yet. So instead, we're just going to say it's the range of some other map which we'll represent with a question mark. So what do we know about this question mark? If the red line in R2 is the range of this other map, that means this map has to be a linear transformation into R2. Now, before, we said A throws this red line into R3. So let's say our question mark map does the opposite. It throws the range of A in R3 back down to R2, hitting this red line. For example, if you start with this vector in R2 and apply A, it would squish to this vector in the range of the question mark, and say be thrown to this vector in R3. Now our reverse map would take this vector from R3 and throw it back to the one it came from in R2. This question mark transformation kind of has the feeling of an inverse of sorts, because it's in some sense undoing the transformation that A does. It's not really an inverse though, because we can't get back to the exact vector in R2 that maps to this one in R3. Also, there are vectors in R3 that A never maps to. In short, A isn't invertible, so it doesn't have an inverse. Instead, we'll call this question mark transformation the pseudo-inverse of A, because it sort of acts like an inverse of A. We'll use A plus to refer to A's pseudo-inverse. What's the range of the pseudo-inverse? Well, it's the red line in R2 that all of the vectors are mapped to. How about its null space? 
Well, we said that the pseudo-inverse maps anything from the range of a in R3 back to R2. So what would it do with this vector, for instance? This vector is not part of the range of a, so what the pseudo-inverse can do is just consider the component of the vector in the direction of the range of a. Essentially, it can project the vector onto the range of a, and then throw the projected vector back to R2. So the null space of the pseudo-inverse would then be all the vectors in R3 that get mapped to zero when squished onto the range of A. The entire null space would then be a plane in R3 and look something like this. And hey, look at that. We have our four fundamental spaces from before. The key takeaway is that the transformation A and its pseudo-inverse A plus provide a way to translate from the same line or subspace between the input space and the output space. This line is called the range of A in the output space and the range of A plus in the input space. Every vector not completely in these spaces has components that are in the null space of A in the input space or in the null space of A plus in the output space. And these components disappear when you apply A or A plus. Another way to look at this is that the null space of A plus gives a sense of what vectors in the output space can't be mapped to by A. And the null space of A gives a sense of what vectors can't be mapped to by A plus. Of course, the two ranges are not actually the same line but are linear transformations of each other. We can then see A as performing some kind of dimension-maintaining transformation on just the range of A plus to arrive at a different subspace, the range of A. That's what the four fundamental subspaces let us do. We can describe which subspaces are transformed, the ranges, and which subspaces are thrown out, the null spaces. That said, this is not the normal picture given when discussing the four fundamental subspaces. Normally we have the range in the null space of A transpose rather than A+. Plus. So what's the relationship? Where does the transpose fit into all of this? To get a sense of this, we're going to have to take a deeper dive into another look at what A is actually doing. We are going to plot the two ranges on the same set of axes now. I'm not plotting the null spaces because they don't contribute to vectors in the ranges. Note that the range of A+, plus is now in the xy plane here. I've also included an example vector in the range of A plus and where it maps to in the range of A. Okay, now we're going to break A down into three steps. First is a rotation in the domain of A, here at the xy plane, so that the range of A plus ends up pointing in the same direction as the range of A, but in the xy plane. Next, we're going to scale up all the vectors in the rotated subspace so that the vectors line up with the ones in the range of A. Finally, we're going to do a rotation in R3 to transform the rotated and scaled vectors into the range of A. Because each of these transformations is a linear transformation, we can describe each with a matrix. We represent the first rotation with a matrix V transpose. It just rotates the range of A plus within the input space. V is an orthogonal matrix, so its columns are all orthogonal and of unit length. This means both that V is invertible and that its transpose is its inverse. So V transpose times V is the identity. This fact about orthogonal matrices will come in handy later. The next step is the stretching transformation. We'll denote it with a matrix sigma. While it stretches, it also moves the line from R2 to R3. It has the same shape as the matrix representing A. Because it only stretches, its only non-zero entries are on the diagonal. It has one non-zero entry per each dimension in the range of A. In this case, the matrix would look like this. Little sigma is the scalar that all the vectors are stretched by. Finally, there is the last rotation that moves the scaled line to the correct position in R3. This transformation is represented by the matrix U. U is also an orthogonal matrix, so there's no scaling performed, just pure rotation. Altogether, that means that multiplying a vector by A is equivalent to first multiplying the vector by V transpose to rotate it in the input space, then by sigma to scale it and throw it into R3, and finally by U to rotate it in the output space. This equation is referred to as the singular value decomposition of A. It's called a decomposition because it breaks A down into three parts, the rotation, the scaling, and the second rotation. The singular values are the names of the entries in the sigma matrix that indicate how much A scales any vector. This decomposition also gives an intuitive way to understand the pseudo-inverse. For the pseudo-inverse, we start with a vector in the range of A. We rotate it in the reverse direction, which is equivalent to multiplying by U's inverse, which is U's transpose because U is orthogonal. Then we scale the vector down 
This is equivalent to multiplying by a matrix that contains the reciprocals of all the non-zero entries in the sigma matrix. You also flip the dimensions so that it becomes a transformation from R3 to R2. It turns out that this is actually the pseudo-inverse of sigma. Finally, we rotate it back to the original orientation to arrive at the range of A+. Like with the first rotation, this is equivalent to multiplying by the inverse of V transpose, which, because V transpose is orthogonal, is V transpose is transpose, which is V. That was a lot, but really all you have to get out of that is that applying the pseudo-inverse of A is the same as undoing a second rotation, then reversing a stretching, and finally undoing the first rotation. Altogether, we then have the pseudo-inverse as V times sigma pseudo-inverse times U transpose as opposed to the singular value decomposition, which was u times sigma times v transpose. So basically, we switch the order of the rotations and transpose them, and make sigma squish instead of stretch. This is lovely, but it doesn't answer our original question. What does the a transpose mean? Well, away from the geometry for a second, we know that if a equals u sigma v transpose, then we can transpose both sides. And then the transpose of the product of some matrices is the product of their transposes with the order flipped. Which gives us this. Does this look familiar? The only difference between the transpose and the pseudo-inverse is what you do with the sigma matrix. The rotations V and U transpose are identical. Remember that in the pseudo-inverse, the sigma matrix undoes the stretching of A. However, the transpose performs the exact same stretching as A. It has the same sigma value. Okay, let's go back to the geometry to get a feel for what A transpose looks like. First, we multiply a vector by U transpose. It's the same reverse rotation as in the pseudo-inverse. Then, we stretch it by the same amount that we stretched the original vector, because the singular value is the same. Finally, we rotate the stretched vector back to the original line with the matrix V. This is the same as in the pseudo-inverse. So there you have it. The transpose acts very similarly to the pseudo-inverse. It undoes the first rotation of the original transformation, stretches the vector by the same amount, and then undoes the second rotation. This is amazing. Just turning the columns of a matrix into rows undoes the rotations while keeping the stretching the same. This means that A and A transpose allow you to translate some important space, in this case the range of A, between two spaces, in this example R2 and R3. Now all that's left is to tie the transpose into the four fundamental subspaces. What are the range and null space of a transpose? Well, as we just saw, the transpose and the pseudo-inverse have the same form. So the range and null space of a transpose are the same as the range and null space of a plus. A transpose takes you from the range of a back to this line in R2. Because it only transforms the range of a, its null space is also this green plane. This leads to the final picture you find in textbooks. And that's it, the four fundamental spaces as they're usually given. While there are some nice algebraic proofs that you can use to show the exact same thing much more quickly, I think there's a benefit to being able to visualize what these transformations actually represent. It's also nice to be able to see how the transformation A, its transpose, and its pseudo-inverse allow you to map some subspace in between two others. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them below.